uh, greetings to one and all. Today we want to be talking about uh, church polity issues or church government. You know, the ways that uh, local churches must be governed. Is, is there a prescribed way by the Bible, in a scriptural way of handling things and the uh, issues of authority in churches and uh, related issues, you know, all about the churches, you know, the church government and uh, such things as that. You know, I was asked uh, a bunch of questions by a brother who's uh, apparently very astute and uh, in his understanding, he's, he's, he says that, you know, church polity is one of the things that uh, he is on his, you know, top five priority, things that he ponders and, uh, you know, things about. So he asked me, hey, brother, what's your understanding of church polity regarding elders and deacons' role and authority, the congregation's participation, contributions, tithing or giving instruments or no exclusive psalm singing or hymns included, associations or conferences between churches, invisible general or the visible local Sunday Sabbath, etc. And there's a whole bunch of questions. Now, uh, uh, you know, it's just uh, some of these questions are well beyond me and my expertise, if I'm an expert on anything. Well, the reason I'm giving this talk, not that my opinion is of any weight or authority, but hopefully I can engage your minds and hopefully motivate further studies in God's Word. If I can, if I can send you back to scriptures, to, you know, if I can engage your minds to think scripturally upon these matters, my job is done, you know, in that regard. So that's basically just to provoke your further uh, thinking on these uh, things. They are fairly important. Now, about the church polity or the government, how churches are to be governed. Is there a prescribed way? And what are the offices uh, in the church? Of Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, when we talk about church polity of governments, usually what we mean is that there are you know various ways in which historically uh, churches have been ruled. Okay, we have the and some conspicuous differences between so-called congregational forms of church government the, from the word congregation, where basically it's the rule of members and the it is the Casting the uh, uh, vote of members with a, usually a single elder or pastor. That would be you know, the case for many Baptist churches where it's the strictly congregational form of church government. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have Episcopalian uh, forms of church government with the bishops. It, the Episcopalian comes from the Greek word episkopos which is also translated as overseer in some Bible translations, but basically refers to one of the same office with the elder. But according to some, and it's the very ancient tradition in itself, it happened very early, earlier in the New Testament uh, period when uh, this distinction took place between elders who were considered you know, local pastors you know, performing the function of a uh, local pastor, between them and bishops who were presiding, who were elevated over and above local presbyters or elders. All right. So the Episcopalian uh, form of uh, or Episcopal uh, form of church government is of course characteristic of you know Episcopalian Anglican and Roman Catholic, of course, and the Eastern Orthodox tradition. In all this uh, huge uh, orders and churches, you have bishops who are above, have greater power vested in them. They can depose and, and install the particular, uh, uh, you know, parish priests or, you know, presbyters, elders in local congregations. So this is the Episcopalian a system of church government and you have also in between sort of the Presbyterian or Reformed uh, church government where you have plurality of elders in a local assembly in a local congregation so you'll have not just one elder but usually several elders depending on the side of the congregation individual congregation 
as the case may be. And then you have also so-called high courts of appeal. So you have the so-called classes or a presbyter, a presbyters in the Presbyterian tradition where you have the sort of the local on, on the level of state or a few states uh, in America. You'd have Northeast or, you know, Western, Southeast, that sort of thing divided into geographical uh, locations. So the closest assemblers would send their delegates, their elders, teaching elders and ruling elders, we'll come back to that later, and they preside over matters especially of doctrine or if there's some dispute in a local assembly, they can't handle that case in the local assembly, so they, get, they, they send this uh, grievance or the question to a higher court, as they call them. So, and then the next level would be the general assembly or synod in the continental reform tradition where you have basically the uh, delegates from all of the constituent uh, local uh, churches in a given denomination. Here's another word. So they'll be deciding, especially on matters of doctrinal uh, importance, you know, and they'll give their deliverances and usually what, uh, what they decide, the, you know, the, this uh, meeting of elders and pastors from all over, their decisions are binding upon constituent local congregations. So that's the, 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 the Presbyterian uh, form of church government. Now, how do we know which way is better, which way is scriptural? Do we know, is there any, you know, really solid way that we can decide, well, this, this is, you know, scriptural and this is not? Well, first of all, let me tell you from, from the outset that I don't think that the Episcopalian system uh, should be seriously discussed because, as I'll show in a moment, it really is it's based upon this unscriptural distinction between the so-called, uh, I mean, the bishops and elders as different offices. But uh, as we'll see, I'll read to you from uh, Titus. Now, the main portions of the Bible which deal with the offices, and there are offices, in the Church of Jesus Christ, or you know, service figures, or elders, the same are called bishops, sometimes in the, in the very same self same uh, context, and deacons. These are normal uh, ministries that are to be continued. Now, God gave for some apostles and prophets, and then pastors and teachers, as He says in Ephesians, some of the offices are no longer here because they have served their purpose and the church is now being built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets as Ephesians 2.20 makes it clear. So we don't have any apostles today or prophets because they've, they've been gone. There's no need. The apostles were qualified to be so uh, because they were witnesses especially of Christ's resurrection. Now let me let me uh, show you something that I encountered this morning as I was uh, doing my just regular Bible reading, and I, I encountered something that I never saw before. So I wanted to share that with you because it kind of it has some connection to this whole topic of church government and and such things as that. Remember, this is uh, in um, Acts one. The apostles are dealing with the departure of Judas and they're saying, look, we got to find somebody to replace Judas who went to his own place. And so they cast lots. They presented two candidates for to replace, uh, to take place of Judas among the 12 so that the number should not be broken. It must be 12, you know, corresponding number as the number of patriarchs of the Old Testament church. And so, um, and Peter says this, um, he says, starting from verse uh, 21, Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness 
with us of his resurrection. So we see here the qualifications for the apostles. The apostle must be somebody who witnessed, especially the resurrection of Jesus, who was there. So, and uh, that's no, that applies no longer to anybody uh, today. So, and they appointed two. Joseph called Bar uh, Barsabbas, it was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, shew whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, so they, they, they cast in lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, we're not going to comment on the custom of casting lots and deciding, you know, which candidates and so forth, because there's also a whole debate whether or not this, this is a normal practice to be implemented in churches. You know, we're not going to touch on that. No, we're going to talk much about the whole situation. I mean, you understand what's, what's going on in general. But what drew my attention was that this guy, there was two guys, that the first one was Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus. Now, Justus is Latin, you know, Justus, which means just. So basically, and the same thing in English. So Justus means that this person had a surname, surname or reputation for being a just guy. So that was sort of his nickname, a just. Okay, this Joseph was called Justus, all right? So particularly, there was something about it. Now, the Bible does not spell for us in what way, but uh, we may legitimately surmise that this guy was an upright man, that he had a reputation of being a just, a righteous person. Now, you and I both know that there, there is no other righteousness but from the source of righteousness, the true source, which is Jesus Christ. That there is none righteous, no, not one. So whatever else the Bible means by calling this person justice, it must mean that this person was truly justified, that he was a believer. But apparently, his behavior, his reputation, his general demeanor was such that he was known, well known, so that people would call him justice, okay? This guy is so upright in all of his behavior and his conversation that uh, they call him just, all right? And it's interesting, so he was presented in Matthias. Now, the second guy we know virtually nothing about apart from his name. He's, he's mentioned basically just only here in uh, Acts 1, and then we don't hear of him at all. But but the point is, and so they are casting lots that the praying, O Lord, thou knows the hearts of all men, show us which one thou hast chosen for this ministry, and so on. And the, the lot fell upon Matthias. So God chose the second guy, from whom we know virtually nothing, whereas the justice was passed over. Now, it kind of occurred to me, uh, th this must be significant. Now, we can't build too much upon it, but... One thing is certain that nothing is uh, of no significance in the Bible. If the Bible mentions the fact that the guy was surnamed just as there must be something upright about him, that he was eminently upright in his uh, conversation, in his demeanor and so on. So he was known for his, and that's a good thing that he was upright. But, but the point is that God chose otherwise. And that ought to teach us something, that God's ways are not our ways. That perhaps, as I was thinking this morning on this passage, that maybe God thought, boy, this, you know, uprightness of this guy may stand in the way, might, might give the impression if we select this guy, if I chose him for the job. And also, oh, well, you know, that is understood because the guy was so upright because of his imminent righteousness he was selected see god chose otherwise maybe so that this imminent uprightness of the first guy would not cast shadow upon the utter super uh, supernaturalness of this 
whole office that it that God's power is perfected in weakness. It is not your reputation per se. It is God's sovereign choice, both in salvation and in installation in office. Something, you know, something to think about. You know, I'm not saying this dogmatically, but it appears to me a uh, somewhat a valid point. But on to uh, our discussions about the uh, <clears throat> forms of church government. Excuse me. I got dry. <clears throat> in Titus, um, in chapter 1, Paul uh, speaks about it, as well as in 1 Timothy. But we'll, we'll select Titus. I'll, I'll read uh, <clears throat> a little bit from Titus 1, because in this passage, it becomes crystal clear to anybody who's reading the Bible that the words bishop or overseer and elder refer to one and the same office or one in the same uh, ministry all right let's go to titus 1 starting from verse 5 paul says for this cause i left thee in crete that thou should have said in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders <coughs> excuse me in every city as i had appointed thee now he proceeds if any be blameless and the husband of one wife having faithful children not accused of right or unruly for a bishop, here you go, a bishop, or overseer, in the Greek episkopos, must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no, no striker, not given to filter lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as has been taught, that he may be able by a sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers this is titus 1 5 verses 5 through 9. now here it is you know again it is just beyond the shadow of the doubt that uh, bishop and elder are the same thing because first he says now i uh, you know i left in creed that thou should have said in, in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city and then he proceeds a bishop must be this and this so it is one of the same thing. So elder, it, it refers more, this is a more of a Jewish custom. Somebody considered elder, it's probably not a, not a very young person, uh, but not necessarily so, but not a novice in the faith. That, that is important. An elder somebody who's been around some, who's been in the faith, who's been tested and tried, and who's, who's gotten this... Uh, Repetition of somebody who's able, who's apt to teach, who's sober, not given to much wine, not no striker, and, and all of those things. So, kind of qualified for the office. Now, bishop or overseer refers to the function this elder performs. He is to exercise the spiritual oversight, bishopry, uh, which, which is that, you know, it is the oversight. And how does he exercise this? oversight how does he do the overseeing it is through the ministry of the word of god and here we come to this um, important uh, question this beef that i have with the reformed and presbyterian unscriptural distinction between the so-called teaching elders or pastors or reverence and the so-called ruling elders who just rule and never preach in their congregations because they say we have two distinct offices a teaching elder who is sometimes called reverend which i think is an unscriptural title no one is reverend but god alone and the so-called ruling elders who just rule and really, this uh, distinction, the whole thing, is built upon a single verse in the entire Bible. Really. It is built upon the, this scholastic splitting of heirs, uh, heirs in, in, in one single verse, virtually. It is in the, it, it's found in 1 Timothy 5, 17, where uh, Paul, given instructions to Timothy in that same first epistle, he says that let the elders, he says, Paul, that rule well be counted of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And people 
develop this whole theology. Oh, see, so let the elders that rule well be counted, especially those. So there are some who just rule, but some who also labor in the word and doctrine. And hence this distinction between teaching elders and ruling elders. I think they're wrong in that. This distinction is unscriptural for several reasons. First of all, the qualifications for elders, which we read of in some detail presented to us in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, speak just of elders and bishops. They don't make any distinction. And both of these descriptions in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, tell us that a bishop or elder must be apt to teach. He must be able to address the problems in their congregation with the Word of God, refuting, exhorting, and establishing people in the right uh, way. Because that's the function. That's, that's how they rule. Because my question would be, if a guy is considered an elder, but he, he can't actually preach, he can't teach from the Word of God because he hasn't been ordained for that purpose. How, how else does he exercise rule? How does he rule? There is no administrative power vested in people, in, in you know, even males, other than the spiritual authority, which is to be exercised through the Word only. There's no other way. I mean, an elder... If an elder is qualified for this office of a bishop, he must be apt to teach. If he is not apt to teach, he can't be an elder. You know, I know of a guy, and even uh, among of my friends on Facebook, you know, I know this, this church, I know the pastor, and virtually, but still, you know, I'm sort of acquainted with him. Uh, and the elder in that congregation, the pastor goes away for a vacation, you know, which is fine. I mean, the pastors need sometimes some time off that, that is perfectly okay. So he goes away on vacation. I said, well, who's preaching? He said, well, the elder says, and he's, he's, he's an elder in that uh, congregation. He says, well, I will read the printouts, the sermons left by the Reverend so-and-so while they're vacationing. So you're an elder in that congregation? Yes. So, so well, I, he said, I can't preach. You know, I will read those printouts. Because I am supposed to be preaching. He has been ordained to preach. You have the reverend who's right now on vacation. The elders will just read what's been written, left by their minister. To me, the whole distinction is unhealthy. It is, is downright unscriptural. And for, for, for another reason. Now, the word, again, this, see, this distinction is built upon the single word, especially. See? It says, let the elders that rule well, again, this is uh, 1 Timothy 5, 17, uh, that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, the word that's been translated as especially, or especially sometimes, in the King James, is the Greek word melista, which can be translated, because that's, it's, but that's one of the shades of meanings of that term. It can mean... That is, or I mean this. So it is sort of an explanatory, that is, namely, okay? So what it might mean, actually, the sentence this, the, that Paul is saying, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. I mean, that is, those who labor in the word and doctrine, okay? And the elders who don't labor in the word and doctrine are not supposed to be called elders. There is no eldership aside from the ministry of the word. Okay? So to me, the whole thing, it just falls apart. I mean, elders who never preach are not elders at all. Now, we move to... The sub-question to that, well, do I believe that there must be one elder or pl plurality of elders in a given congregation? I think that this question is kind of uh, 
sort of open uh, in the sense that uh, I don't think that the Bible real lays it down real hard that it must be just one elder or several elders. It suggests that in early church, in, in some congregations, there were several elders, like in the church at Antioch, which would send a Paul and Barnabas. There were apparently several people functioning as elders and overseers and elders and overseers among you. So yeah, but by the same token, in Titus 1, we see that uh, I left the increase for this purpose, that, that I might ordain uh, elders in every city. So th that might be suggestive otherwise, that is just in a given uh, little, you know, again, city, that's probably just towns, little villages, just, you know, whatever that place. Uh, one congregation, maybe just one elder. Also, in the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, where we see the letters written to the angel of the church of Ephesus, the angel of the church at Smyrna, and so forth, the different places in, in Asia Minor, we see those angels. Now, most sound Bible commentators and theologians agree that by those angels, and the, the book of Revelation is highly symbolic, it's highly spiritual and apocalyptic in nature and all of that, with all these images, so the angels represent just ministers, okay? Not angelic beings per se, because the Greek word angelos means the one that is a messenger, okay? So the messenger, to the messenger at Ephesus, write this. The messenger at Laodicea, you write this. So all of these... Uh, uh, messages sent to the, the ministers in those congregations. They were responsible, not some angelic spiritual beings, but their ministers. And since it addresses one minister, it may be suggested that uh, one minister is enough per congregation. On the other hand, the argument goes, well, in the multitude of counselors is safety. And the plurality of elders in a given congregation, especially if the congregation is fairly large, one pastor sometimes it really is insufficient to keep up with all the oversight. I mean, it's just one pastor and you have so many problems in the studies that, you, that they lead and the, the preaching and catechizing and so forth. It's just that it, sometimes it can be overbearing. He must have some associates. So you have associate pastors and in, 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 that's perfectly fine. And also, when you have this sort of council of elders, uh, sometimes it helps to deal with difficult problems because it's not just you sitting there alone, but uh, you really have other elders to weigh in on a given matter. However, by the same token, the number of people who take active part in decision-making process does not ensure necessarily that the decision will be right. You know, sometimes just big, you know, uh, uh, gatherings of people, nevertheless, vote dead wrong and they, they just uh, give wrong verdicts and so forth. I mean, take the history of the church. Sometimes it's just the huge numbers of people uh, took wrong sides. And sometimes it's the lone individuals who stood against a whole a great number of people voting otherwise or thinking otherwise. So again, it's just not the majority opinion that ensures the orthodoxy of a given decision. So it is kind of, you know, I can't, I can't be more dogmatic. I don't, I don't have a problem with, you know, several elders or just in one elder. I don't think it, it is all that important. Uh, we have here some flexibility according to the needs of a given uh, congregation. One thing is certain though, that no elder is above any other elder. And here I sort of, I'm somewhat critical of the way that uh, uh, doctrinal issues are handled in the, you know, so-called Presbyterian Reformed Churches where you, you send your, your grievance and, uh, uh, you know, two classes and then it gets sent to the Senate. You have to wait a whole year and then the decision is made and delivered, then it's binding and so forth. I, you know, I have trouble with that. I'm all for association of churches. Uh, but the reason that is usually given for the necessity of having higher courts and presbyters and the synods and general assemblies 
is usually taken from the New Testament, the book, from the book of Acts, like in, in Acts 15, we read of the so-called Jerusalem Council, the first Jerusalem Council, where you have the first universal ecumenical council of representatives of churches to decide on this uh, hot issue at that point, that burning issue of whether or not the Gentiles should be made to observe the law of Moses. You remember the story in Acts 15. So the, in the, they stand up and they give their opinions and so forth. Then they deliver this letter to the, the Gentile churches. Now, this was taking place while the New Testament was still in the baking. It was still in the oven. See, they didn't have even the book of Acts while they were still in the book of Acts. It was still in the making. And therefore, they did not have the complete canon. Now we do. Now we have all there is to be had. Therefore, in my opinion, again, I mean, you know, I may be wrong. People say, well, look, sometimes or not, we have ethical demands that were not encountered by earlier generations of believers. So we must tackle them so that it takes a collective wisdom of elders, for, for instance, using uh, medications which uh, uh, to develop which they've used the stem cells and so forth, some ethical, sometimes difficult, naughty issues and so forth. It takes the collective wisdom. All right, maybe so. But for the most part, the Bible is crystal clear. Now, again, the classic verse which I appeal to is that uh, Paul does not seem to be suggesting that it is a normal rule or, you know, for same practice and churches that, boy, if you have a problem that you can't really solve in a local congregation, you got to have a general assembly. He doesn't say that anywhere. Uh, moreover, uh, if we if we go to uh, if we go to uh, the most famous uh, verse in um, let's find it, okay, in the uh, Second Timothy uh, chapter three verses sixteen and seventeen. Let me go there for for a second. Yeah. Okay, that's the, the famous verse that we have all scriptures given by inspiration of God. And all scriptures given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scriptures given by, that, by God. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, so the... Implication is that the man of God, in the context, of course, it refers to all believers, but, but, you know, but centrally, the man of God in the context is some, somebody who is put in charge, okay? The medic, especially those who's teaching, okay? So he may be, he is equipped. The, the word perfect means complete, equipped enough, sufficiently supplied. So the supply is there. We have the whole canon of Scripture now, complete. Okay, we're lacking, we're not lacking in anything. Okay, we have everything at our disposal. And the scripture is clear enough. So that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. See, it does not say that sometimes you've got to have a synod in order to understand what, what you're supposed to be doing um, on the issue of racial reconciliation or whatever else. Or sometimes the churches have to ponder the issue whether or not the hidden sodomy, not an outward practice homosexuality, but if a person just feels attracted to persons of the same sex, whether or not that should be considered sin or not. So you got to have a whole bunch of uh, reverence pondering this issue and they will give their verdict which will be binding upon the local assembly so this is what uh what we think the word of god is, is teaching these matters we don't we don't need special occasions and uh, you know special gatherings of uh especially qualified people to teach us that you know scripture is fairly clear on all these things and again 
these major assemblies historically have not been very orthodox, okay? Despite the fact that, uh, you know, in the multitude of councils, there is safety. Yes, if those councils be sound, but when you have a bunch of people, you are almost certain to have a bunch of sinners as well who may err and may, may err greatly. So that, that's my two cents on this. So I'm, I kind of tend to be more congregational. I, I don't have objections to several elders in a given congregation. And, and of course, there must be fellowship among like-minded churches. Uh, and again, the, the person who asked me the question, he said, well, what about this distinction between the uh, uh, invisible versus visible churches? Boy, that's another deep uh, thing, but uh, in a nutshell, of course, the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, uh, is not exhausted by a given local assembly, okay? And sometimes we have, you know, 5, 10, 15 people who understand it's not the fullness of the body. Now, it's interesting that the Bible uses images which are applied to the church worldwide, to this uh, whole body, and it's not the only image, it's not just the body, okay? The image of the body and the hand and the, the, the foot and the eye that Paul uses, these are useful insofar as they present the unity, the essential unity to the head. But there's another picture that is used as well by the same Paul, that is the olive tree, the covenant tree. And you have the root, you have the, the stalk, the stem, and you have the branches. We being the wild olive branches being engrafted into the same tree but it is one tree now we understand that this tree must be huge it's been of all generations of the faithful from the beginning of end to the end of time and so forth but uh, we also have the complete uh, local assemblies which are sufficient in a sense that in a given place you have a gathering of believers there you have the presence of Christ. He makes us complete. It's not that the local assembly is so self-sufficient that it needs no other fellowship with nobody else because we're, boy, we're just a complete, but no. What it means is that, yes, you have the organism here and you have the Christ who supplies all that is needed. In, in scriptures, we have the fullness of all that we need for faith and practice, but it doesn't mean that we need no fellowship with other like-minded churches. And here you have the, uh, the problem of having creeds. And that's another issue, that the creeds are helpful as a shorthand of presenting your views, because otherwise, how do you know which church to relate to? You've got to have, uh, you know, some things verbalized. This is what we believe concerning man, God, salvation, sin, Christ and such things as that. So they're not to replace the Bible. They're not over the Bible. They're not sufficient in themselves. They're just shorthand so that every time you don't have to invite the bicycle, you can say, well, okay, this is the statement that we, we subscribe to. But that's, uh, you know, it has some pitfalls because no confession, no confession whatsoever is 100% bulletproof orthodox in all points in every jot and tittle all of the writings of man have weaknesses and we're not to subscribe under any of those documents wholeheartedly because we might encounter something that will bother our consciences and it is not good to go against your own uh conscience all right there's there are many other questions but i guess i'm uh, out of time right now and out of breath as well but I uh, wanted to just uh, start this conversation, just to uh, provoke you further reading in scriptures on, on all those uh, things so that you might have an educated uh, opinion on these matters. May this all be useful by way of sending you back to scriptures unto the praise of the glory of His grace given in the Beloved. Amen.